back, everybody. Uh, Sharon White. Sharon, your first RTS Cambridge Convention. Welcome. Thank you very much. I think your first broadcasting industry interview. It's the first one, six months into being in Ofcom. Okay. Well, we're going to start with an archive clip. I Don't worry. I. It's not you at school <laughs> or on a school party or something. It's uh, the first chief executive of Ofcom, Stephen Carter, now Lord Carter of Barnes. It's 2003. Wow. Uh, in a session called Get Carter, uh, and basically, don't worry, we, we haven't got a Did version for you. Did I haven't you got succeed? A version for you. Yeah. And the interviewer is Tim Gardham, who you know. So let's have a look at that clip. I get the impression that underneath, you get quite irritated with the television culture. I mean, there are a couple of uh, quotes you've been quoted as saying at one stage, television is a subset of the internet. You're on record of saying that calling television the former lead medium. It seems to me that when people say that television is special, you don't really believe that. No, I, I think television is very special, and I hold my hand up. I'm a big consumer of television. I love television. I just don't think television is as special as people who work in television think it is. Um, <laughs> So first question, Sharon, how special <laughs> are the people who work in television? Well, I don't know what the superlative for super special is. Yeah. I mean, I'm, um, first of all, I should say it's, it's absolutely fantastic to be here and um, fantastic to have made my six-month milestone in Ofcom because I feel less like the newbie, new girl at school. I mean, I'm a, I'm a TV kid and... Um, I mean, it was slightly embarrassing actually trying to think back to how much television I actually watched as a child, to the degree that, to which when I, I was at college here, that when I got to university, I didn't know what it was like to work without having either EastEnders or uh, another soap in the background. And certainly as in Ofcom, television's really important, not just because um, people know I'm an economist by background. This is a sector which is, you know, the second biggest... Um, in the UK, the, I mean, you can feel the vibrancy um, of the creative industry, but also it's what makes, you know, it's the pleasure for so many, uh, for so many people. And certainly as a regulator, what's really interesting, uh, and actually it's interesting seeing uh, Stephen's clip, is that actually television and content is driving hugely the sort of the economics and the commercial strategy actually for the, for the telcos. You know, BT now setting up a television company. You know, who would have thought even two or three years ago? Yes, yeah, so it's super special if that's, if that's the phrase. Well, okay. well uh, picking up on that, I, I bumped in your, into your Edinburgh. Uh, I think I was one of the few people who realised who you were. <laughs> that must have been an interesting moment to be walking around the Edinburgh Television Festival, um, almost, uh, you know, unknown. What did you observe? You're almost a fly on the wall. What did you make of the, the people you saw there? Yeah, no, I, I thought the Edinburgh TV Festival was fantastic. I managed to make most of the sessions before my children turned up on a Friday to head off to the book festival. And because I'm new to the sector, one of the things I was really keen to do, actually literally sort of sitting on the back row of uh, lots of sessions, listening to the debate. I was there for the, uh, the McTaggart lecture, formerly the Ermano Yannucci. I was there for Nicola Sturgeon with the alternate McTaggart and also actually some very, very interesting sessions uh, by some of the, um, uh, the, the broadcast chiefs. And I guess a couple of, in, maybe two or three impressions, apart from just how young everybody was, um, <laughs> is, um, I guess, firstly, just how much the BBC discussion has dominated, which I... It would be interesting to hear Tony later, which I hadn't, um, I hadn't quite expected. Um, some of you will know that in my previous life, I used to be uh, the lead advisor on public spending. So, uh, you know, there's a sort of question about the, the, the license fee deal. It's something I'd um, had some, uh, some um, interest in and some expertise in before I took this current job. So the BBC question, which actually just reflects the importance of the BBC within the ecosystem that everybody's talked about today and yesterday, was very striking. I was also very struck by a lot of the discussion about the OTTs, which, as some of you will have known from the PSB statement we did before the summer, you know, we see as there are opportunities as well as challenges, but it was quite a downbeat, I felt, um, maybe that's too strong, but quite a 
you know, certainly the sort of, you know, the challenges felt stronger than the opportunities, probably outside actually the session I listened to, Peter Fincham at ITV. So just the sense of the, the mood and the debate, but also I went to see some lots of great stuff. And it's very exciting seeing actually some of the apprentices, some of the young people with great ideas who were going to be the future. I, I, had, a, I had a ball. Good. Now, uh, it's traditional at these events to ask you what television programmes you watch, but well, I'm not going to ask you that. I'm going to ask you a question which Ofcom asked the public. So it seemed to me reasonable to ask the Ofcom chief executive. Which one of these things you use almost every day would you miss the most if it got taken away? And I'm going to read seven, and you can choose one of them. Games player, tablet, books, magazines, newspapers, radio, PC laptop, mobile phone, TV set. You, which would you miss the most if it was taken away? Yes, by some very large margin, my mobile phone, right. which, uh, you know, I have become one of those sort of, you know, quasi 18 year olds who wakes up in the morning and the first thing I do before actually checking that my husband's still there is to check my, <laughs> my uh, you know, my Twitter feed and I'm afraid my Google Ofcom alerts. Right. Now that, according to Ofcom research, makes you more digital than your age group. So I know, I've, definitely, I've definitely got more digital in the last six months. I think I was sort of on my age, which is 48, right. uh, before I joined. So I'm, I'm glad that I'm running down the youth spectrum. Thank you. Let's come on to these policy issues. There have been enough of them in the last couple of days, the Secretary of State's speech. Uh, and obviously, as you said, the, the significance of the whole BBC Charter Review. I want to start off by talking in this section about regulation of the BBC. Yes. Now, uh, you appeared before the Select Committee. I think pretty much everyone who saw it was impressed. I don't think you had anyone sitting next to you. There was no one shoving notes. You asked, answered all the questions, and you showed a very striking knowledge. But you did say some quite interesting things. Uh, you said you would put a line in the sand between things where Ofcom has a track record. By that, I think you meant content regulation. Yes. It's not an enormous big deal for Ofcom to do a bit more content regulation mm -hmm. on the BBC. And on the other hand, what you said, the question, uh, which you said and implied would have to be answered by a regulator, which was, has the BBC effectively discharged the responsibilities in the new charter? I happen to agree that's what an external regulator should ask. But here's your answer. That is not a responsibility that I think we have the competence to discharge. So should I say a bit more? I didn't mean well, to... I think, I... Tell us why you said that, because I think most people particularly bearing in mind that Patricia Hodgson, your chairman, probably knows more about the BBC than anyone in this room, wouldn't it be natural for Ofcom to regulate the BBC? Absolutely. Why would you not want to, to regulate the BBC, given all the things you already do in broadcasting? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. And always, you know, being interested in a select committee is not necessarily a, a sign yeah. of success. And I, I guess a couple of things to say yeah. is that, I mean, obviously there's been an awful lot of discussion about um, the future governance of uh, the BBC and... Uh, we now have a clear process. David Clementi, former Deputy Governor of the Bank of England, will, uh, will run a process over the next few months. I think um, there has been some, um, I won't even say confusion in the debate, but the debate has been pretty generic and pretty high level in relation to what responsibilities Ofcom may or may not take. And I think my, the, my first objective at the Select Committee, and I guess also today, is to try to separate out governance or corporate governance, um, you're running this, you're overseeing the strategy, you're supervising the budgets, you're, you're doing the recruitment, you're appointing people, that oversight, which can only be done by a set of governors who are close to the institution concerned, separate from regulation. And where I start as a regulator is where, where are the, you know, where does Ofcom already have a good track record and some experience. And indeed, where are the areas where we already have, as you know, because you used to be responsible for it, you know, some lockers with the BBC. And those are two very clear areas. One is around broadcasting standards, where, as you know, we already um, oversee the BBC for broadcasting standards outside its commercial channels for everything other than impartiality and accuracy. In respect of its, uh, the commercial um, side of the business actually for the entirety as we do with the other broadcasters who you know happen to be domiciled in the UK so that's one big slug that we already do the other area is when called on by the trust we uh, examine we've got some fantastic economists and other analysts you know is a change in the scope and remit of the BBC likely to have a deleterious impact 
or indeed a positive impact on the rest of the market. Now, the, the question uh, you ask about where the line in the sand is, the, the thing I, I would say is a, is a, you know, it's not you know, ultimately our decision, but where I would be uncomfortable is for Ofcom to be deciding the detailed shape and scope of the BBC. Right, well, let's explore that. I think we understand, yes, the content regulation bit, we understand that. Uh, two, the market impact assessments. I think everyone would understand that you already do that. Why not do? You don't want to do the governance. But onto that, if the question has to be asked to somebody, has the BBC effectively delivered what the Charter asked it to do? You don't want to set the bounds of what the BBC is expected to do. But are you saying you shouldn't review at the end of each year the BBC's performance against its charter requirements and say whether it's doing its job or not? Are you saying you don't want to do that? I'm saying it's an area that I feel less comfortable in mm -hmm. than the areas of broadcasting standards and the market impact analysis impacts of the BBC and the rest of, um, of the EK system. The, there are, you know, I'm sure David Clementi will look at this, there are clearly options. So the first question clearly is actually what the charter looks like, how more or less prescriptive the charter is. There is then, I'm sure David will explore the option as to whether there is a, you know, some sort of internal compliance function within the BBC which says, you know, if we do end up with a unitary board, um, actually is the unitary board... But I, I board do understand you don't, you don't want to be the unitary board and you want to emphasise that the unitary board exactly. is running the BBC. And I guess my, my answer to your question is it's not an area that I feel... Uh, naturally that we have got a deep degree of comfort in uh, within the context that you know, we'll wait and see how the, how the review runs and what responsibilities we do and don't get. It's right. not something we're thinking. The thing that strikes me about the discussion we're having is that uh, I've seen and heard quite a few Ofcom executives appear before select committees and when I was there I appeared before a few myself and the line I was always given was if they ask you why you do this and you don't do that, the answer is we do what Parliament asks us to do. And here's Ed Richards, 2013, when asked about regulating the BBC. Clearly we could, compared to the regulation of the Royal Mail, it would be comparatively easy. <laughs> Whether we should or not is a matter for government and ultimately for Parliament. Mm. That's not the same as your answer, is it? You are, you, if you're saying the line in the sand is not quite where it appears to be drawn, but you, are, you were trying to draw a line in the sand. I mean, I mean, Ed's right, which is that ultimately, you know, I will happily discharge the duties that... Uh, that Parliament gives us. We have got a review, it's a transparent process. David will look at options. And you know, I guess the first point is that you know, I'm not seeking any additional responsibilities. In the context of, of where, as Chief Executive, I feel as an organisation we've got experience and expertise and a degree of comfort where we are to take on additional responsibilities, as I say, one area is, is broadcasting standards. I would not call that a trivial. Um, I would not call that a trivial task. And as I mentioned to the select committee, the scale of complaints that uh, Tony is lucky to receive each year, 250,000, uh, compared to the complaints that we get across all the other broadcasters, it's 25,000. So even in an area where we've got great people and expertise and experience. You know, it, it, is a, it would be a big upscaling of responsibility and resourcing, but also just senior bandwidth, because the BBC, you know, has got a place in British public life like no other broadcaster. Okay. Let's move on to one of the issues that talk came out of the Secretary of State's speech yesterday. We're going to have uh, not just a review about regulation, we're going to have a health check rather than a review about terms of trade, and Ofcom is going to do it. Yes. Now, on the 2nd of July this year, Ofcom said, it is too early to assess the full impact of market consolidation, and we will keep this area under close review. So just two months after it was too early to, to uh, assess the full impact, you're going to assess the full impact, is that it? <laughs> um, so John and I haven't, um, we haven't had a direct conversation on this, although we have exchanged letters. Mm. Um, I mean, it's worth going back not just to the bottom line of what we said in the PSB statement, but actually to some of the analysis that 
that led to the conclusion, which was actually very similar. I mean, the, I thought the, the first session today was absolutely fantastic, chaired by Lorraine Hegesy, because in a sense it, it illustrated um, some of the dilemmas actually rather more entertainingly than, um, than our document before the summer. So what we said was, on the one hand, sorry, I'm sorry, I'd probably be altering think, the room. <laughs> It's, it's here. Actually, both of the authors are here, so yeah. <laughs> um, so apologies. Yeah. Um, but we said in the statement that, you know, on the one hand, it's a great opportunity because there's, there's more money um, going into the system, as you know better than me. You know, you look 15 years ago, there were real issues in terms of the sustainability of some of the indies because you know, they were one or, you know, dependent on one or two uh, big hits, so there's more money there. But in, term, but in terms but just of what... Sorry, just to answer, sorry, yeah, sure. Stuart, but on the other hand, we also said, you know, we're worried about the lifeblood of the SMEs. At the moment, you know, we're not raising the warning bells that this is having a difficult impact on our public service outcomes, but it's an area that we want to watch. And I think on the back of that, the Secretary of State has said, well, actually, I want to have a, more, I want to have a fundamental review you know, possibly earlier than we might have done otherwise. Right, we well, see, in terms of what may have changed between July and now, I can't but help noticing that charter review process started, and, and Tony Hall published a document last week which has a line, we will ensure that our commercial ventures always have a strong pipeline of intellectual property, the lifeblood of the business. So it's not just the lifeblood of the SMEs you're saying, he's saying it's the lifeblood of the BBC. I noticed in the previous session, and Peter Salmon absolutely avoided the question about terms of trade, saying he wanted to have a good relationship with the independent sector. I can't but assume, other than the Secretary of State wants to, as Tony does and Amado Anucci wants to do, is to build the international business of the BBC, and to do that they need as much IP as possible. I think you're probably further ahead than, <laughs> than I am on this. At the mm. moment, uh, John's written, we've spoken very, 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 very cursorily on the way to dinner last night. Yeah. He's keen to have a review. He said to us, you know, as he said in his speech on Wednesday, he doesn't have a predetermined outcome and wants to make it an open review. We will now very quickly need to talk to him, pull together some terms of reference, but actually it needs to be an open process. And I know John McVeigh and others, there'll be lots of people um, in the room this afternoon, but outside, whom we're going to have to consult and look at this in an evidence-based, analytically focused way. And I, I'm, I'm not going to be drawn into, into judgments before we've done the serious work. Okay, let's move on to another policy point, the possible privatisation of Channel 4. Now, John has been saying recently, the remit remains, it doesn't matter what the ownership structure is. Now, at the moment, Ofcom regulates Channel 4 in almost two ways. One is the license. Now, certainly in my experience, it's not impossible for a commercially owned, profit-driven broadcaster to deliver the license. It's mostly a question of quotas, it's a question of hours, and ITV and Channel 5 have, have delivered those hours. So, personally, I don't question that. The real issue is about your monitoring of the delivery of the remit. Now, at the moment, the remit, which is defined in the Digital Economy Act, is set out in all sorts of phrases. There's one that talks about um, uh, delivering, uh, stimulating well-informed debate on a wide range of issues, providing access to information and views from around the world and by challenging established views. Could you actually see yourself calling in the commercial owner of Channel 4, say some of the American guests you've seen here today, and saying to them, the content board has determined that you're not as challenging established views enough. It kind of doesn't sound like a conversation that you'd want to have. Um, I go a few steps back, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, firstly, it's not clear to me that the question of privatisation is on the agenda, and certainly every time John Whittingdale, I've heard him asked on the subject, he has uh, gone out of his way to, to praise the health and the you know, very peculiar uh, and yet successful um, uh, the parameters that set Channel 4. I mean, you would never... You, can, you can't imagine any other country in the world that would set up a broadcaster which says, you know, we've got this social remit, but non, uh, but non profit uh, making. So, first of all, I'm, I'm not sure that, you know, this isn't. This it's isn't going to happen anyway. I'm not sure that this is anything more than a hypothetical sure. issue. Secondly, in terms of where Channel 4 is currently, as often we're pretty positive about the success of the last two or three years. There are areas that we, we worry about. I'm sure we'll talk a bit about diversity later. 
You know, Channel 4 is incredibly important. The diversity spending has been falling. Some questions on the, inter in, on the international front and children's programming. But actually, Channel 4 seems to be in pretty rude health. Now, as to conversations I can imagine myself having or not having, one of the great joys of having uh, <laughs> run the public spending round at the Treasury, I've been in all sorts of rooms with all sorts of people saying all sorts of very difficult things, but it feels to me that we're, we're, a, we're a few steps away from that. Okay, let's move on then. Let's talk about you. You came from a uh, comprehensive in North East London. I did. You came here to Cambridge to a college, did a degree in economics. You've been through a number of government departments. When you appear before the select committee, every single MP was a man. Um, <laughs> when you come here, I, I can't check the ethnic origin of everyone in this room. I think I'm fair to say very, very, very few people in this room are of Afro-Caribbean ethnic descent. How do you feel when you're at these sorts of events? And I mean, it must have happened to you a number of times in your career. I say it's very striking. So I've worked as, um Stuart says in lots and lots of different places. I'm, I'm essentially, a, I've worked in government public policy, but internationally, so World Bank as well as domestically. So I've been in situations where of great diversity, such as the World Bank, but actually very, very narrow social economic diversity. So everybody's from all over the world, but they all turned out to have been to Harvard and Stanford and <laughs> Cambridge. Yeah. And, you know, I've worked in a Treasury Department where probably the number of Etonians around the Treasury Board has been actually rather higher than I was used to even at uh, Cambridge. I have to say, coming from an economics background, the media side is less, interestingly, less diverse um, than, uh, than Whitehall and than, uh, than, I say, even the Treasury. Uh, uh, and, we, and why we, do you think that is? I think it's really, I mean, it's really interesting because you, you know at um, Edinburgh we launched the diversity toolkit. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think it's a complicated, don't think it's a, I don't think it's a single answer. I do mm -hmm. think there is something about, you know, there's not, a, there's not a clear career path. So, you know, I want to go off and work for some, you know, I want to work in the business, actually informal contacts yeah. and the, you know, the sort of, rather muddy way in which you might sort of navigate your way in. At the same time, there are lots of people who are very committed to making a big difference. And I look at some of the things that Channel 4 or Sky or Tony and others are doing, there's a huge amount of commitment there. I think translating that into some very practical ways uh, is, is the gap. And certainly in my experience, I used to be gender champion for the civil service is that you've really got to get into schools and not even getting into schools at GCSE level. You've got to get into schools, in some cases, at early primary school, particularly for girls. I mean, I've worked in sectors where actually we spent time in nurseries, you know, explaining that Lego did not have to be pink and, you know, it's all about building the kitchens and uh, play centres if you're a girl and it's about building great things if you're a boy. It starts really early, but... As I say, the conversations I had in Edinburgh, I think there's a huge amount of willingness uh, actually to make a difference because there has been progress and we all look around and want there to be more diversity, not just in the industry, but actually reflected back at us in the programming. I mean, let's, for those who haven't seen it, I certainly would, would give it a neck, neck plug as well. This is from the Equality and Human Rights Commissioner and Ofcom. And basically, it answers the question which certainly those of us who are non-execs on boards and keep asking why don't you do this and why don't they that to be told we're not allowed to this I think clears it up what is and isn't allowed and there are some very interesting things so the Rooney rule as it's so called yeah. in the NFL is not allowed but I think the Lenny Henry plan for ring fencing f training f uh, funding that that is allowed but to pick up your point about links there's a, there's a headline here that says reduce the use of unpaid internships I think we know what that means don't we that means arranging for your friends or colleagues, kids, to have placements in the broadcast industry. Is that what that's about? Well, as I say, the, um, you know, if you were wanting to widen in a transparent and fair way the talent that comes in, you've got to have, a, you've got to have some process for that happening. And if they're internships, it means you advertise, you go out to a full range of universities, you start at school, you've got to find a way of broadening the group of people who think, you know what, it could be me. Mm. 
Doesn't look like me yet, but you know what? It could be me because somebody's actually taken the time to come have a conversation and talk through the possibilities. And, you know, we all know how phone calls happen because, you know, lots of us, that's, that has felt like the only route. But I think finding ways in which, even for some of our small companies, certainly for the large broadcasters, where we can have a bit more transparency in some of the entry routes, but it's not just about entry, because again, all our experiences, it's often easy to get a diverse group of people in, and then there's a sticking point, often in the middle or just before you get to a middle ranking. So actually, what are we doing in terms of looking at some of our internal progression routes? Okay, thanks very much. Now open up to the floor. Uh, as the lights go up, first thing we're going to do actually is to have a vote. Two years ago, there was a vote here about who should regulate the BBC. Oh, um, I guess so. I remember it well. Because I shall abstain. You should definitely <laughs> abstain. Uh, actually, the Green Paper offers three options. That's the trust or a version of it, Ofcom or what do you call it, a sort of, I suppose, boutique uh, regulator in the shape of off people or something like that. So those are your three options. I've asked for a show of hands. One is uh, uh, the Trust or a version of it. The other one is Ofcom. The third one is off Beeb. All those in favor of a version of BBC Trust? Well, I had to say it, yeah. <laughs> right, it came out. Those in favor of Ofcom? Those in favor of off Beeb? I think the Ofcoms have it. The people have spoken. Uh, Sharon, you can <laughs> take that away. Right, questions to Sharon now. Is that James Purnell putting his hand up or scratching his hair? I can see that. I was wondering how many people were not voting for the one reason. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. Should, should we have abs abstentions? Oh, the abstentions. Sorry. Oh, I see. Are those all BBC staff? That's really, uh, or Ofcom staff as well. Okay, well, that's, a, that's an indecisive outcome then, I think. But, but I would think of those voting, the majority were for Ofcom. Okay. Right, let's take the questions now. Yes, the front here. Hi, Sharon, Philippa Giles, Bandit Television. Can I just say that I think you're a fantastic role model. I think it's amazing to see someone like you speaking so authoritatively um, and from such a diverse background. I produced, um, executive produced Luther. When Idris Elba came on that show, it was, it was completely colorblind blind casting. We, we chose him because he was the best actor for the role. Um, he said, I want behind camera to reflect you know, what you've done by choosing me. And that was a big challenge. Um, and it remains a big challenge to continue to do those things. What I feel um, about the kind comments you made about the, the kind of initiatives that are already going on in the industry is that they are often not enough. You know, you said there's a lovely warm feeling up in Edinburgh, and, you know, but that has been the case for mm -hmm. 25 years. I mean, I made a show with Alan Yentel, who was controller of BBC mm -hmm. Two, called um, Debbie on Two, with a West Indian producer called Vicky Licorice. And things actually have got slightly worse rather than better since then. And I think we need to do something far more mainstream. I mean, before I left the BBC... Can I we, was... sorry, just, we, just trying to bring it to a question. So do you, do you, is your question that you, what, what more could be done? Is that No, I, I just want to say, yeah. if, if it's all right with you, trying to sort of continue with this, that, that, that what we mustn't accept is this sort of slight complacency about we're giving Lenny Henry, you know, a programme and that there's a little bit of, you know, ghettoisation going on. What we could do is something that we roll out, as we were going to do on Silent Witness before I left, you know, black producer and black HODs and all those things. We've got to do something in mainstream, otherwise it feels to me it's just gesturing. Would you agree? I agree. Um, <laughs> <laughs> how could I not? Thank you. Can I just add one, one, um, one further comment, which actually picks up some of the analysis we did in the PSB statement, which is um, the area where the PSB system, or one of the handful of areas where the PSB system is wanting is around, as you know, reflecting ourselves, reflecting ourselves at a point where you've got devolution and you've got an increasingly multicultural society. And so if you have this conversation in Scotland or Wales and, or amongst um, people from an ethnic minority background, it's a very similar point. And so the issue is not just about programming, it's about programming in a, in a non-stereotypical way way where you feel that you're reflecting back a mainstream, ordinary, almost colorblind casting. And I think that's incredibly important. It's not just ticking a box, it's that the programs themselves genuinely have a reflection back in a way that, that's credible and people feel you know, satisfied with. But just to follow up on that, the, the Ofcom view traditionally 
traditionally mm. was that actually Ofcom didn't want to get into representation matters. That really, you know, that was for that was those were issues of you know creativity and things like that, yeah, and it was well, not not for a regulator to trade. Are you saying? So I think it's really I think this is really important. I think it's important firstly because actually we have a statutory duty to support opportunities in the on the training and employment side of the industry. But more than that, you know, we've got a we've got a job which is about the integrity of the PSB system, which is, a, for me, a sort of compact between, you know, the taxpayer and the public good of broadcasting. And part of that is that the, the society is reflected back in the programming, and that pushes forward, you know, this is, you know, this is, bit, this is about our sort of cultural well-being. And, you know, if you look at our diversity, when I, you know, as I say, from, from my sins, I used to spend a lot of time looking at demographic and ethnic statistics. You know, 10, 15 years ago, our ethnic diversity was 4, 5, 6, 7 percent. It's almost doubled. You look at the, 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 um, the data for our cities, even beyond that, we're, we're becoming a different country. And this is the media. You know, all of us have got a great opportunity to demonstrate society as it is today, not as it was 20, 30, 40 years ago. Okay, let's take other questions. Uh, top left, up the back there. Just It's David Lancewood at PwC. Um, Sharon, in other sectors, some have said that regulators have um, become closer to, or at least more aligned with government over the last five years, <laughs> financial services, utilities, and so on. How would you describe the relationship you'd like with government? Oh, I have to say one of the nice things about having moved, I loved Whitehall, um, but you definitely, I definitely feel myself personally very much um, independent from government, although working constructively with government. So I have to say, I mean, it's only six months in. I mean, I have never felt any um, pressure, any, um, I've not been in any conversations or any situations where I feel that I'm being sort of politically influenced. And obviously for Ofcom, you know, independence from government is an equal concern as independence from our commercial um, operators. So personally, I feel in quite a comfortable place. But there are some areas where you are effectively an agent of government. There's nothing wrong yeah. with that. I mean, if the government wants to sell a bit of spectrum, they'll mm. take advice from you, but actually the decision to sell is theirs. Mm. And, and, and as a civil servant in the Treasury, mm. in a democratic society, at the end of a conversation with a minister, the answer is yes, minister. But at Ofcom, Ooh. on some matters, oh, we tell us different. It's a much but, longer conversation. But, it's, but there's some have. matters on Ofcom, and I think you have standards cases where the government may have a view. I can think of Theresa May's interest mm. in how terrorism reported, where actually, occasionally, the answer is no minister, isn't it? So, I, this is a much longer conversation. Can, can, when I say independence, one should not confuse that with a public interest role. So, for example, you know, the John Whittendale requesting Ofcom to do a piece of work on terms of trade. That piece of work will be evidence-based and analytical, and that will be a piece of work that, from our expertise, we will be happy to, to, to publish, and it will be a public document. You know, I, the, the slight irony that some of you know, my husband runs the Office of Budget Responsibility and has had a sort of similar conversation with the Treasury Select Committee this week in terms of the relationship between the ABR and the Treasury. The independence is, stems from the evidence base and the quality of our analysis. Even when there are times in which we are an agent, we do that on the basis of our expertise, whether we're running a spectrum auction or doing a piece of advice on media plurality or media ownership. We are beyond, and I'm, I say absolutely without fear or favor because you live or die as a regulator by your independence. This is absolutely fundamental to us. Okay, last question. Uh, anyone over that side? No, okay, let's, um, okay, Simon. Aubrey from Campaign for Broadcasting Equality. Uh, if Ofcom had taken its Section 337 powers and obligations more seriously, this room wouldn't look the way it looks today. Now, last week, uh, the Minister in the Lords said that Section 337, which Ofcom, your predecessors, tried to shuffle off, is not going to be shuffled off, and said that Ofcom shouldn't hesitate to use the powers under Section 337. Will you consider what more Ofcom could do under 337? Uh, probably two responses. I suspect the, uh, 
the uh, diverse makeup or not of the industry is, uh, is a collective, <laughs> yeah, it's a very much a collective endeavor of which clearly Ofcom, a regulator, has parts, has a partly a role, but actually it's very much a partnership across all of us as employers, as program makers, as, as analysts, as regulators. Um, I'm very clear, and that's why I was very, it's very important to me that I signed the forward for this diversity toolkit. I'm very clear that this is a big priority for Ofcom. Now, uh, I'm also a big believer that data really matters and that throwing sunshine on an issue really matters in terms of actually just all of us understanding progress but also uh, how much more there is to do. And so the work we're doing with Project Diamond and the Creative Diversity Network, for me, really matters. Um, and as an Ofcom, we've also got a responsibility, I have a responsibility as an employer of 800 people that I'm not preaching to the industry, what we're not also reflecting back within the organization, and there's more that we can do. We're at 41% women, we don't have enough women in our senior levels, there's more that we can do, although there's progress that's been made. Okay. Thank you very much. Sharon White.